Okay, so today's uh, topic we're going to talk about scapular positioning. Uh, shoulder is very sensitive to alignment, so uh, where the scapula sits in space is going to determine the health and the status of the muscles that are the scapular stabilizers. Um, I like shoulder work. We've done a lot of really successful shoulder work, and I think it's a great example of this uh, coaching the body approach that we use. So uh, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about um, our modality, how we approach uh, restoring muscles to health. I was trained originally in traditional Thai massage and um, had a certain amount of success but there was really no anatomical training in that, and I was a little frustrated because I didn't know how to apply uh, the, the postures and the stretches to specific clinical issues, and, and that's really important. You really have to be able to suit uh, and follow what's happening in the body in real time, so you can't just follow sequences. Uh, I met Claire Davies in 2002, and got involved in trigger point therapy, uh, and then that became a modality that I originally called uh, clinical Thai body work, taught the first class in 2005. Um, what we're doing now is really the evolution from that, and we now call it coaching the body. It includes the trigger point work and elements of corrective exercise and also uh, self-care, but really our focus is on empowering the body, empowering the client to do their own healing, not to be dependent on experts, not to be in the dark as to the source of their pain. Uh, this approach really works. We've had great results with it. We tend to see things differently, I think, than most of the world sees uh, the origins of pain. And uh, so uh, it's been very encouraging, and we're going to show a specific example a little bit later about correcting shoulder alignment, but uh, I just want to talk about how we approach it. So we see it as facilitating the body's own innate sense of healing uh, as opposed to fixing things. When you assume something is broken, you have to fix it. It becomes kind of a black box. The person feels out of control, and it's actually an inaccurate uh, assessment of where the pain comes from in most cases. So we want to engage the client and the body, uh, the central nervous system, in the process of healing. Once you do that, uh, then that innate healing mechanism takes over, which is very powerful, and it sticks. And, uh, you know, this is very different than the sort of uh, injury model that we deal with in uh, most of the world. So our understanding of pain, where pain comes from, is really very flawed. Uh, today, uh, in popular culture, in the medical system, most people assume that all pain is a result of some form of damage. So if you have pain in the front of your shoulder, the issue is what kind of injury do you have? It's a very old concept. It's actually now been disproven by modern neuroscience. But uh, we can at least trace this back to the 1600s. So Descartes proposed this very mechanistic idea of pain. So you have, you touch a fire, and a tube actually sends the noxious signal up to your brain. Your brain then is just sort of a sensor, a mechanistic sensor for that uh, disturbing signal. So uh, that idea of pain really sticks around today. You know, it really hasn't changed much from the time of Descartes. But uh, if you look at modern neuroscience, uh, the idea now is that we've realized that pain is really a synthesized experience. The, the central nervous system and the brain are taking all of the inputs that are coming in. The, and some of those are physical inputs but some of them are not. For example, emotional pain is processed in the limbic system in the same place that physical pain is. Uh, we can have uh, referral uh, signals from trigger points. Those can produce quite substantial pain, and uh, they don't relate to tissue damage at all. So this understanding of pain allows us to uh, treat the body in a very different way. We're not going after treating an injury. And I love the quote from... Uh, Professor Lorimer Mosley, University of South Australia. He's a physiotherapist who's 
uh, done a lot of really great work uh, on, on the modern understanding of pain. And he says that tissue damage is neither necessary nor sufficient for pain. So it's really unrelated. You may start with a case of tissue damage, but then you migrate to a place where you have pain that's no longer even connected to the original inputs. And some of those inputs may be historical. Uh, some of them may be you know, just patterns that you've had that have burned into your system. Uh, as I said, emotional stress, things like that. Uh, Myofascial trigger points are small areas of stagnation in muscle, and uh, they will uh, send signals to the central nervous system that are interpreted as pain. However, the confusing part about it is that the trigger point exists in a place where uh, you're not even aware of it, and then you might experience your pain in the shoulder, for example. Uh, it's almost always somewhere other than where the uh, static uh, capsulation of the trigger point is. So uh, what the problem with this system is that uh, the, the medical people don't understand how it works. So pain referral is on the edge of modern neuroscience, and there's speculation about how it actually happens. It's clinical reality, though. Those who, who work with it, like uh, we do, uh, it, it's beyond dispute. You see it every day. It's very predictable. So uh, ironically, the medical profession accepts pain coming from a smooth muscle, for example, in the heart, pain going down your left arm. That's pain referral from organs. But pain from skeletal muscle, for whatever reason, is not accepted. Um, if you do a little uh, looking around on the internet, uh, I, I found one plain, pain clinic's uh, website that uh, you know offered what your problem is if you have pain in the front of your shoulder. So the options offered are, are all injuries, bursitis, arthritis, tendonitis, some, some tor torn tendon or something. So it has to be an injury. It's like, which injury do you have? Now, if you explain the pain that way via this mechanistic assumption that there is tissue damage, then your only options are to try to repair the tissue damage or to try to mask the pain. Now we see severe shoulder pain all the time in our clinic. We almost have a 100% success rate with changing that in a very short time, usually in one session. We're not treating injury. So the fact is most reported pain uh, in clinics, people that, that try to get help, uh, most of the pain is due to the soft tissue uh, trigger points as opposed to uh, actual damage. And that can be even in the presence of MRI findings, x-rays, and so on. Just because there is something that may not be completely normal in imaging doesn't determine, doesn't correlate well with the person's experience of pain. If you have that worldview that pain derives from injury, that will determine your treatment. The treatments that we offer people in the medical system uh, are primarily anti-inflammatory drugs, surgery, uh, cortisone, which really just is a, a very temporary anti-inflammation measure. Uh, ultimately, though, when pain becomes more severe and chronic, then it leads into opiates. Uh, and I think it's, it's extremely sad and unfortunate that today we have the highest levels of opiate addiction in history in this country. Uh, people are dying from it. Uh, Prince was a recent example of that. Uh, I've seen it in my practice, and it leads to a path of decline. You know, one, once you are uh, introducing that level of uh, painkiller into the system, you're not helping the pain, you're not fixing anything, you're introducing more stagnation, and it's gonna be a downward spiral. Uh, so eventually leading into decline and even death. Uh, people transition often from the prescription opiates into street drugs because the prescription runs out and they're addicted. So this is my mission. I have a very uh, strong feeling about our ability to change this approach to pain. We have a, a high rate of success in doing this, and we're doing it by uh, believing in the body's inherent uh, self-healing mechanism. Uh, trigger point therapy, while it is considered suspicious by some scientists, has been validated by a lot of clinical studies. As I said, we don't 
necessarily have uh, a real clear understanding yet of the physiological mechanisms for pain referral because it gets into some advanced neurological concepts, upregulation and things like that, which are really at the frontiers of neuroscience. But uh, if you make the assumption that trigger points are a significant contributor, you, you are a really experienced practitioner who can uh, treat the trigger points and help the body sort of lengthen those fibers again, you will have success. We've proven it now for the last uh, decade. We've been doing a lot of that work in our clinic. So an example. So the most common pain uh, if somebody experiences in the front of their shoulder, the most common cause of that pain is your infraspinatus muscle with trigger points in the back of the shoulder. So this is a very confusing situation. First of all, because of the locality, you know, pain in the front of the shoulder, people are going to try to rub that. They're going to try to fix that and, and uh, assume that there's some sort of injury there. But the fact is, the infraspinatus muscle in the back, which is a very important uh, stabilizer in the rotator cuff, and with our postural issues, often gets uh, disturbed and overused and out of alignment. Uh, generally, you can, uh, you can fix the pain with that kind of approach, just going into uh, the, the trigger point model. So uh, most practitioners are just going to explain that away. The people that end up in our clinic are people that have already been through multiple practitioners. They've been given painkillers and other inappropriate treatments and are really shocked to find that we can help them. Uh, so uh, trigger points in these clinical studies are estimated to be responsible for 80 to 90 percent of reported pain in the clinics where they studied it. Now latent trigger points uh, just cause muscle fibers to shorten. So what happens in a trigger point is the center of the sarcomere contracts, we call it a contracture, and it produces an artificial shortening of that part of the muscle without the input uh, from ATP. So the advantage of a taut fiber is it doesn't require energy input. And so the body can recruit these taut fibers as a means of stabilizing an unstable joint, for example, or taking up slack. If your shoulder is always forward, it may do that in your pec to adaptively shorten the pec because otherwise there's an unstable situation. So uh, it's helpful sometimes to see the development of trigger points uh, as a, a compensatory mechanism rather than uh, a problem or an injury. If you understand the logic of the body, then you can kind of get inside it. You can help the person resolve it. Uh, pain referral is uh, very thoroughly mapped at this point. We have a very good understanding. It's very repeatable in most cases. And uh, the mechanism itself, we haven't explained, but we do see the clinical phenomena. Uh, so you have the postural shortening. Now, when a trigger point goes active, it will cause pain, but that is a thresholding effect. So what happens is the pain may appear and it may disappear, which is very confusing for people because that may not be associated with physical activity. So for example, uh, if you get dehydrated or you end up with uh, a little more activity or stress in that part of your body, uh, you may find all of a sudden your shoulder hurts and then it goes away. So it, it's all very confusing for people because of the worldview issue. If you, if you just understand it as injury, uh, that uh, makes it very difficult to understand these phenomena. So I think of trigger points as, in psychology, we have this concept of splitting off where something goes unconscious. You know, you may have a trauma as a child, and then you sort of forget about that. Your psyche absorbs that, buries it, puts it in a place where it's no longer accessible to you. But then, perhaps as an adult, you uh, have anxiety in certain situations that doesn't make any sense. Well, uh, you can approach that by uh, sort of discovering the real cause in the sense of the original experience, bringing that back to consciousness. Well, the same process is happening in the body. When you have trigger points and you have pain in the front of your shoulder, Yes, that fools practitioners, but it also fools the body in a sense. So 
the, the nervous system is experiencing that pain as an injury. And so then there's a tendency for the neurological uh, system on both sides of the joint to start to lock that joint down, reduce movement because that's an injury. It could be painful. We don't want to produce more damage. So any form of pain, uh, even referred pain, causes neurological changes. And we start upregulating, creating more synapses. The body wants to make sure that we address the pain, but I see it as kind of a state of confusion. So if you approach it in this coaching model, that you are working with the body and working with the person to bring the true origins of the pain to consciousness, rather than you're gonna to go to sleep and I'm gonna do something and fix you and you'll magically wake up and be better. Um, we uh, have great success with that. And um, so we're gonna talk about that specifically in relation to the shoulder. But that is kind of how uh, we see it. The body can easily repair trigger points because trigger points are just very small areas of metabolic stagnation as opposed to tissue that's torn and ripped. And really all you need to do is restore metabolic flow in that area, get the sarcomeres to move again, and the pain disappears. Now on the other side of the coin, if we uh, follow this injury model, we just give the person drugs or surgery, we intervene, and it doesn't really work. Um, what happens is we have this upregulation, the nervous system becomes more and more sensitive to pain. And uh, people then uh, end up on escalated levels of painkillers. It goes into the opiates. At some point, the opiates don't work. You know, there are people with 24, 7, 10 levels of pain, uh, inaccessible to treatment from opiate drugs because it's no longer connected to the original problem. It's a sort of a state of profound confusion in the nervous system. So you cannot intervene physically. There is no way to make that go away. You have to uh, treat the neurological uh, aspect of it. The results of that obviously can be catastrophic. Once you are on long-term opiates, uh, your uh, prognosis is very poor. So this is sort of the uh, thing that motivates me to do what I do. Now in the case of shoulder pain, uh, it's very easy given our lifestyle to sort of work with a rounded shoulder posture. We use a lot of our mobile devices and so on. Well, as soon as we start to have asymmetry over some period of time, but, and we don't work against that with corrective exercise and things like that, the body's gonna start shortening. The pecs is gonna start maintaining that state of asymmetry because that's a form of instability. You may be a dysfunctional breather, you may work out in the wrong way or have a stress on your muscles. Acute or chronic stresses can start to introduce trigger points. Now unfortunately what starts is perhaps a minor sort of pain where maybe you feel a little twinge as you move your arm uh, can easily develop into one of these scenarios where the body is splinting and you're no longer uh, moving like you used to move. You start reducing movement. And then it's a sort of inward spiral where movement gets more and more reduced. The body splints the joint more and more. So I see our role as uh, when these people come in and they can hardly move their arm, it's undoing that spiral down. And you're finding the places that are blocking at each stage and sort of facilitating the body to see it's not really injured. Uh, we deal with this muscle, now you have a little more movement. We deal with your infraspinatus, now you can externally rotate a little bit more. And that incremental process of coaching the body out of that splinted state, uh, we can generally get pretty profound results in a single session even with diagnoses like frozen shoulder, uh, adhesive capsulitis, you know, very, very severe pain. So the mission of uh, this coaching the body uh, approach that we've developed is to really change the system, to change this misguided uh, approach to pain that is really hurting and killing a lot of people. Uh, and I think that's only gonna get worse. And by educating clients, educating practitioners, we can uh, make a difference in this. So 
We have three components that we uh, pay attention to. Uh, first of all, the manual therapy or body work. Uh, we use uh, the techniques that we've taken from many different forms of body work and also developed ourselves in, in a way to uh, facilitate the uh, restoration of range in muscles that may have trigger points and may have reduced their range. And uh, we use that coaching approach in terms of uh, we know where to press so that we can uh, have the body able to move without as much pain. So we start to open things up again. Uh, Self-care is very important. The whole approach is really to empower the, the person to change their own health. Uh, Self-care is a series of small exercises that they can do on their own that allow them to uh, treat the most important areas of tenderness and then start to uh, bring length back into the muscle. So if they are sitting in front of their computer, their shoulders are rounded, they know what to do to kind of work against that. And then of course, how they exercise, hopefully they do, uh, and we encourage that, but because the body, health is movements. The body and muscles are made to move. If they don't move, stagnation results and the downward spiral. So our approach to corrective exercise is to use these trigger point principles so that we understand what's happening to muscles and we understand why people feel pain. And right within the corrective exercise practice, they're able to use muscle energy techniques and lengthen the fibers as soon as they work them. So if there is a temporary uh, state of overload, that you're undoing that during the exercise practice. So you don't then have some sort of hangover where your shoulder hurts and you have to go have somebody fix it. Um, so I just want to summarize our approach to the, the manual therapy part. And uh, Doug Ringwald, who's uh, uh, developing this coaching the body approach with me, is going to talk about the uh, corrective exercise and self-care components. Um, in the body work, the first thing we do is we're using, we, we do some assessments, you know, just static assessments, but then we're using assisted and also active motion to uh, begin to understand what's limiting the motion across a joint. And that uh, we have to ask the person where they're feeling pain or where they're feeling a pull. And that tells us what the active limiters are. So certain muscles are going to pop up as the, the most profound limiter of a certain type of motion. So we're going to go to that muscle first. And then we use various modalities, heat, compression. We use a point stimulator, muscle energy techniques. Uh, we're really pretty universal in our use of techniques, anything that works. Uh, but we uh, work with the movement to uh, relieve the trigger points in that muscle so it isn't causing active referral and those taut fibers aren't limiting range. That's going to start to increase the body's ability to move. Uh, a really important component that uh, isn't done a lot uh, is treating the shortening side of the joint. So whatever uh, side you are uh, working on, if we want to stretch the pecs, for example, we're shortening the trapezius, that's what we're going to talk about later today, uh, you must deal with the shortening muscle because if it spasms and creates a pain signal to the nervous system, that will shut down the stretch. A lot of people don't get that. They keep trying to bang away at stretching the pecs and uh, ultimately the body just produces a wall. So we're always working on the shortening side, often we do that first then we try to increase uh, the length on the opposite side of the joint. We use a lot of feedback, manual feedback over the muscles because that turns off the neurological signals that cause the body to protect, limit range, and, and split. So it's really facilitated motion with a lot of manual feedback, using the breath, uh, coaching the person into being able to work through some levels of discomfort. We're not trying to produce significant pain, but there may be some discomfort in the course of moving out of this very locked up state that they're in. We're able to do this generally with a frozen shoulder type of uh, client in, in a single session, 90 minute session, 
um, we can often produce 20, 30, 50 percent uh, improvement in their condition. And then finally, we're using regional motion, regional stretching with muscle energy techniques. So contract, relax in the beginning. It might be very, very small in the beginning, but then gradually you're getting into more uh, uh, integrating stretches that involve uh, a range of muscles and then active range of motion because the nervous system needs to uh, integrate. So the person needs to integrate this sensation that they're able to move without pain. That's the only way things really change. Uh, Dr. Simons of Travell and Simons uh, made a statement at the end of his uh, life that uh, basically you haven't fixed the problem until the nervous system has taken that in and gone through cycles of active range of motion to uh, really have that sense of normalcy again that you can, you can move without pain.